Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasri Gaur Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So I've been asked to speak about the importance of these different works like Bhagavad Gita and Nectar Devotion and Isopanishad and Hare Krishna. Sorry to interrupt, but unfortunately we can't hear Maharaj right now. The audio is cut out. Can we fix that, please? Can you hear now? Yes, now we can. Oh, what happened? Okay. I think so I, was muted, Maharaj. Oh, okay. So anyway, the, um, the scripture is very important in our uh, Sampradaya, not just our Sampradaya, all Sampradayas, they do emphasize scripture. And we see that all of the different sampradayas have their acharyas who wrote commentaries on different works like Upanishads, Vedanta Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, etc. Uh, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, though he didn't write anything as commentaries, and he, all we have is a shishastaka, uh, nevertheless, he empowered the Goswamis of Vrindavan to write works. So they dedicated a lot of their time to writing scriptures. Now, of course, this peculiar thing about our Sampradaya is that uh, though we have scriptures, we also emphasize spontaneous love of Krishna, which is Raganuga. And then people think, well, then we don't need scriptures because uh, scripture is Vaidhi Bhakti and Raganuga is uh, dependence on inspiration from the people of Vrindavan, not on the scriptures. But that's also erroneous. Uh, and though uh, Rupa Goswami and others were also absorbed in meditation on pastimes of Radha and Krishna. They also dedicated a considerable amount of their time to writing these different works. So, uh, therefore, even if we, the Sampradaya of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is emphasizing this Raghunuga Bhakti, uh, we do not neglect the scriptures. Uh, so, uh, therefore, uh, we find that. Uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, seeing the mm, degenerated state of the Gaudiya Sampradaya, uh, he began to uh, publish. At first, he had to find the scriptures, different scriptures, and then he began to publish them. Huh? And that was uh, in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, like that. At that time, a lot of the scriptures were not much available, and even people had not even seen a Chaitanya Charitamrita copy. <laughs> he had really searched. Some people said, oh yeah, we've heard about it, but we've never seen one. Mm -hmm. So he searched and searched, and finally I think they found one in somebody's old suitcase, you know, some old copy. And so then they began to print Chaitanya Charitamrita, but it was very difficult to find a copy of, you know, very major works. So uh, thus he was emphasizing the publishing of these works, and he made commentaries on some of them. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur also followed his uh, example. And he actually had a printing press, which he called the Big Murdanga. And he was um, very, very enthusiastic to keep publishing works. Uh, and then we find Srila Prabhupada also. Uh, though the uh, Yuga Dharma is Harinam Sankirtan. And he went out in. Thompson Square Park and did Kirtan, etc. <laughs> then he went back to the uh, place on the, uh, what is it, the, uh, what is it, uh, Matchless Gifts, and he would have lectures, <laughs> and he would lecture from Bhagavad Gita. Meanwhile, he was writing his commentary on Bhagavad Gita at the same time, I mentioned that was published, and then he kept writing and writing and writing, and of course he wrote the, uh, his uh, version, the Nectar of Devotion, and he wrote also uh, Bhagavatam, he began the second canto. He had done the first canto in India, then he began second canto, third canto, etc. So, 
Prabhupada also spent a lot of his time in translating and commenting on different works. So uh, this shows that the our Sampradaya has a great emphasis upon the scripture. Now, this is quite uh, different from uh, modern spiritual movements, even those that come from India. They do not have any emphasis on scripture at all. Uh, so we find <laughs> our movement is quite different because we're always quoting scripture. And if you listen to them, they don't ever quote scripture at all, no reference to any scripture. So. This is something quite unique in the modern world that we are emphasizing scripture so much. Uh, so thus, uh, we have all these works, and um, of course Prabhupada said distribute the books, but he also said you should read them. <laughs> so it's not that we distribute to others and let others read them, we should also read them. So we know that um, knowledge, or we call sambandagyan, is very necessary for practicing pure bhakti. If we don't have any knowledge, we cannot do pure bhakti. If we can't do pure bhakti, we cannot get to prema. So we do need that knowledge somehow or other. Uh, and that knowledge is contained in the scriptures. Of course, it's also delivered through the devotees, but nevertheless, its root is the scriptures. Uh, so therefore, all the devotees should uh, start to read, study, and understand the contents of all these works that Srila Prabhupada has written. Uh, so he's made, written some major works, and of course we have to begin somewhere, uh, and eventually we should get to all of them, <laughs> but uh, we have to start somewhere. So now they've devised these different courses. Prabhupada himself, of course, wanted to have different levels of study and graduation, uh, so uh, he didn't accomplish that within his uh, period of life. So therefore, uh, afterwards, uh, devotees began to formulate these different courses. So the first course is Bhakti Shastri. So this has the, I say, the uh, most important works. Not everything, but a lot of the important works are there. Uh, and then later on, uh, other things like the whole Bhagavatam gets covered. Uh, so in this way, uh, there's an attempt through all these courses to gradually study all the works in depth. Yeah? Uh, now, study itself is also a little problematic because um, we have study in the material world, and it often consists of simply memorizing a bunch of things, uh, and then you pass an exam. <laughs> so uh, the study of, for Bhakti Shastri or other degrees, it involves some memory, definitely, but it, that's not the main purpose. Behind that, we should understand the basic principles upon which uh, bhakti is operating. Uh, and also, uh, this goes along with the practice of bhakti. So, in many uh, Bhakti Shastri courses, uh, I don't know if your group is doing it, but uh, as well as the study, uh, they take attendance of your sadhana. <laughs> so they record how many times you're coming to Mangalarti, you're chanting around and doing everything else. That, so that's quite important. Uh, the study cannot be divorced from our devotional practice. Because Rupa Goswami says in Nectar of uh, Devotion that um, you cannot understand this work, the Nectar Devotion, you know, for that matter, any of the devotional works, by logic. Yeah? You can understand by ruchi, by taste. But how are you going to get the taste? Yeah? So the taste you get from the performance of bhakti. Yeah? So uh, therefore, we have to have some sadhana to go along with our study. Yeah? So now coming to the specific works. Uh, scripture is a big field, especially for Vedic scriptures. Uh, most religions confine themselves to one or two books, uh, like the Christians have a Bible, and uh, Muslims have Quran, whatever. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> we have too many books. <laughs> uh, so we don't know what's the book, what is the scripture of the Hindus, and uh, then no one can reply. Uh, they all give different answers, so people get confused. Uh, so it is true, there are many scriptures. Uh, now we have the, we can say, the source material of everything, uh, the Vedas. 
which we call Shruti, which Shruti means herd. Uh, uh, like Shruti also means an ear. Um, and the word Shravana also comes from that. So uh, what this implies is that these works are simply heard, but they are not written. They are not produced. They are not made at a certain time. So Shruti is eternal. And simply Brahma hears it. And then he gives it to his Narada Muni and others, etc. Like this. Huh? And when the universe is destroyed, it will disappear. But next universe, when Brahma is born, Lord will speak it again. Same scriptures, same Vedas, and it'll carry on again. So even though it seems to disappear and appear, it's always the same Veda. Hmm? Same words, exactly. Huh? So that's why um, when you study the Vedas uh, with a traditional teacher, or there's an emphasis on every, getting everything accurate. <laughs> you have to pronounce everything accurately. Huh? So that, that's because it, it relies on the precision huh? to carry on the tradition. Everything has to be exact. Huh? Uh, so these Vedas are, we can say, original. Uh, historically speaking, of course, they're some of the oldest literature in the world. Rig Veda is over 5,000 years old. Uh, most people were cavemen at that time, but in India, <laughs> they manifested the Rig Veda. <laughs> That's historically speaking, but of course, we say it's, in, it's eternal. Uh, and we also say that it was one Veda, and 5,000 years ago, um, our end of uh, Dwarpa Yuga, Veda Vyasa divided it up into four Vedas. So we get Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sam Veda, Tarva Veda. We get four Vedas. Um, and then he gave them two different acharyas to pass on. Hmm? Now, these four Vedas, uh, what, what is a Veda? A Veda, each Veda will have four parts to it. The one or the part we're familiar with is called the Samhita portion. So that's with all of these different you know, prayers to Devatas and Shiva and Vishnu, etc. Um, Prusha Shukta, etc. These all come in the Samhita section, hmm? which is quite large for each Veda. But there's another section called Upanishad. This is the Gyan Kanda. Huh? So these are the Upanishads. Uh, historically or traditionally, say 108 Upanishads, huh? of which 10 Shankaracharya picked out as principal ones. And that, and in there we get uh, Isopanishad among them. And then besides that, we get the Karma Kanda section of the Vedas. Huh? That is... Uh, a group of texts called Brahmanas and another group called Aranyakas. So all these are about karma kanda, um, description of how you use the Vedic mantras for sacrifices and going to Svargaloka, etc. So we get the uh, karma kanda section of the Vedas, the jnana kanda section of the Vedas, uh, which includes Brahman and Bhagavan, both aspects. Uh, and we get Upasana Kanda as well, uh, so, uh, which is the Samhita. So these, each Veda will have these different parts to it. So that makes the Veda quite fast. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the Shruti. And because it, has, uh, it is eternal, there is a certain reverence given to it. Uh, uh, and therefore, generally, all the acharyas will quote Shruti, usually Upanishad, uh, to support any statement they make. They try to get some Shruti statement. Uh, now, Shankaracharya takes the Shruti as the final authority, and other scriptures like Purana is secondary. But we don't do that. We take them all equal. Uh, because the Puranas are the commentary on the Shruti, the Vedas, written by Veda Vyasa himself, so they cannot be less. They have to be equal. So we give equal strength. They should agree. Huh? Uh, so Shankaracharya will say, if they don't agree, okay, we just don't care about the meaning of the Puranas of the Bhagavad Gita. We just go by the Shruti, the, uh, the Upanishadic uh, statements. Huh? Okay, so anyway, the Shruti is one important part, and we see that uh, the major Acharyas tried to write commentaries on the same Upanishads that Shankaracharya wrote commentaries on, and he showed an impersonal thing, so then uh, the uh, Vaishnavacharis write counter-commentaries to show it. It means Vishnu, it doesn't mean impersonal Brahman. Huh? 
So Ramanuja did not write uh, 10 commentaries on those same Upanishads as Shankar, but he wrote uh, his uh, Ranga Ramanuja, one of the later disciples, he wrote commentaries on those 10. Uh, Madhvacharya wrote on the 10 also commentaries. Uh, I don't know about Nimbarka or uh, Vallabha. I don't think he wrote commentaries. Uh, in our Sampradaya, apparently Baladev Vidyabhusan wrote 10 commentaries. But we don't have any 10. We got one <laughs> Isopanishad commentary only, one commentary only. <laughs> so unfortunately, we don't know where the rest are. Uh, so we have one commentary, <laughs> Isopanishad commentary. So uh, that commentary uh, is there. And then uh, for that reason, probably, uh, we find Bhaktivinoda Thakur also wrote a commentary based on that as well. And then Srila Prabhupada also wrote uh, his commentary based on that. So one of the reasons, of course, is because it is Shruti. It's one of the only Shruti texts we have. Of course, we do have another one. Uh, it's called the Gopal Tapati Upanishad. So this is all about directly about Krishna. Whereas the Isopanishad, it doesn't really mention Krishna's name, but at least we get the idea of a personal Supreme Lord, because uh, later in the text it says, remove your effulgence and let me see your form. So therefore we get personalism there rather than impersonalism in the Isopanishad, which is Shruti text. So, uh, we, so we study this because it is Shruti. Huh? Uh, so uh, besides that, besides the Shruti, then we get all the other works. Huh? which we can generally call smriti, as a general category, which means remembered, passed, uh, written, and passed on by sages. In that, in that group, everything other than the Vedas, we will get um, itihasa, which means uh, epic or historical accounts, of which two are primary, Ramayana and Mahabharata. So these are called Itihas. Valmiki wrote the Ramayana and Vedavyas wrote the Mahabharata. So these works are different from the Shruti because they're much easier to understand. The Sanskrit is easier. Uh, it's open for everyone, whereas Vedas only twice born Dvijas can study Vedas. <laughs> Everybody can hear or study or recite um, Mahabharata. So, um, in the Mahabharata, then we get the Bhagavad Gita. So, though it is only one part, one small part of the Mahabharata, it has also become very famous because it gives a very concise summary of the Vedic teachings. That is Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Stanga Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. So it becomes, and it's also easy to understand, and it's not too long. So, uh, Shankaracharya wrote a commentary on this. Uh, Ramanuja wrote a commentary, Madhva wrote a commentary, and uh, Vishnu Chakravarti has written a commentary, Baladevi has written a commentary. So we have um, Vaishnavas are quite enthusiastic to write commentaries on this work because it is very straightforward in presenting uh, the Supreme Lord with a form, quality, and activities huh, as the object of worship. So uh, therefore, it's quite an important work as far as uh, giving proof because it gives direct proof of worship of the Lord. Moreover, for us in the Gaudiya Sampradaya, it also gives the worship of Krishna because Krishna is the speaker and he says, worship me and worship only me. <laughs> so therefore, we can also use this to promote worship of Krishna and Kali Yuga uh, as the uh, word of Krishna himself directing us to worship only Krishna. So quite significant because it gives us a foundation for uh, our preaching. People say, why only Krishna? Why so fanatic? We, say, we listen to uh, scripture. We listen to Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita says worship only Krishna. So well, should we follow scripture or not? <laughs> so therefore, it's useful uh, for us in preaching. So that's itihas. Well, then we get um, another uh, group of literatures called Puranas written by Vedavyas also. Purana can mean old or ancient, or it can also mean eternal, because it's so ancient and has no beginning. But another way we can define Purana is uh, from the word Purna. So Purna means to complete. So Jiva Goswami gives the meaning of Purana as those words 
which complete the Vedas, Purnayate. They are called Purana. <laughs> eh? So in other words, they were written to explain the Vedas. So they should be non-different. Eh? So he wrote 18 major Puranas. Uh, but we see in the story of, uh, in the first canto of Bhagavatam, after writing everything, uh, then Vedavyas was not very satisfied. <laughs> And then Narada Muni came and said, yes, because all of these works are telling people to worship different devadas like Shiva and Brahma, etc. And people will simply get confused by this. Because in Kali Yuga, people are not very intelligent, they have a lot of material desires, uh, they don't live very long, etc. So, just tell everyone to worship one person, Krishna. <laughs> so therefore, he wrote Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is the sum total of the meaning of all the Puranas and the Mahabharata and all the Upanishads and all the Vedas. Non-different. So it's got the final conclusion of everything. And therefore, this is one of the main works that we have. Now, of course, in Bhakti Shastra, you're not studying this because it's a long work, but then you'll, if you pass this in, you go on to study Bhagavatam. But it's one of the main, main works for the Gaudiyas because it establishes Krishna, like Bhagavad Gita, but it goes further because it explains why he is Swayam Bhagavan, why he is the ultimate form, and why he is because he's got all attractive qualities and pastimes, and those pastimes are explained in the 10th Canto of Bhagavatam. Yeah. So that's a, uh, one of the main reasons why we emphasize Bhagavatam, because it gives proof of um, Krishna being supreme, Bhagavan Swayam. Hmm? So uh, that's one type of literature. Uh, again, so we have the, the Shruti represented by Isapanishad. We've got the Bhagavad Gita to represent the Itihasa. And that gives, of course, within that, it gives us the foundational Sambandha Gyan, uh, the basic philosophical ideas that there is a, an eternal jiva different from Krishna, who is independent and conscious. And we have Prakriti, material nature, which has no consciousness. So uh, we get the uh, philosophical aspects uh, presented in Bhagavad Gita for us very clearly, which are necessary for practicing pure bhakti. So, besides that then, uh, we got our, our Shruti and our Smriti in the form of Itihasa and Purana there. Uh, um, then uh, we also need uh, um, an explanation of the process. So that is there in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Also, there a little bit in the Bhagavad Gita. It tells a little bit about Bhakti Yoga. It doesn't say all the details. Huh? Uh, but also, the Prayojana should be explained. Now, this, of course, is elaborately explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam, huh? but it is explained in a very concise way and methodical way in the Nectar of Devotion. Huh? And what is that, that, the, that goal or Prayojana is? Prema. And prema consists of rasa. So we have bhakti rasa mrita sindhu, the ocean of bhakti rasa. Huh? So uh, there are four parts to the uh, bhakti rasa mrita sindhu. Three of them are all about rasa. Only the first part is about sadhana bhakti. <laughs> the means to get to the, of course, it also has a chapter in bhava bhakti and prema bhakti. One chapter on sadhana bhakti of the four chapters. But... Uh, we, we generally study this because it tells us about sadhana bhakti. But actually the whole work, the major part of the work of that book is um, rasa, <laughs> which is the goal. Uh, so we should also know about the goal. Uh, we should know about the process, of course, and the goal. Both of those are presented nicely in the nectar devotion. Uh, so we have sadhana as the practice, uh, which is the abhideya, and we have uh, prema and rasa as the goal or the prayojana. So therefore, nectar devotion is very important. Um, this is an original uh, type of work uh, because um, among the different sampradayas, this is probably the only work on rasa, <laughs> I think. <laughs> maybe maybe Vallabha has a little bit on rasa on it, but um, the, the we call uh, Rupa Goswami the Rasacharya because he has established a, a very concise, clear definition of what is rasa 
and how it relates to the goal and how it is displayed in Krishna. So he gives all that very clearly in the uh, nectar devotion. So it's a very, very important work. Um, and uh, therefore, it's uh, required study. So therefore, also uh, in the Bhakti Shastra, you have to study that work. So very, very important work. Uh, so um, then we have one more work uh, that you're studying that is the nectar of instruction. That, like the Isopanish, is a very short work, actually. Uh, so it doesn't require too much labor to get through that. Uh, but uh, we see that as uh, after the first few verses, then it's all about rasa <laughs> and worship of Radharani. <laughs> so it's a very elevated work also, ultimately. But the devotees, even though they may not uh, understand the depths of the uh, rasa there, at least the first four or five verses they can study very nicely because that gives the the uh, guidelines for doing sadhana bhakti, huh? and what we have to avoid and what we can do, what is favorable, what is unfavorable for our devotional development. So again, it's also good for um, practice of sadhana bhakti. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is another work written by Rupa Goswami, uh, uh, whereas the nectar of devotion is long, quite long, uh, this uh, nectar of instruction is very short. So it gives a summary, we can say it's a summary of all of the uh, nectar devotion into, you know, a few verses. Huh? So uh, in this way, we get a glimpse of sadhana, plus we also get a, a glimpse of prema itself in, the, in that work. In this way, uh, we have a good selection of works so that we can understand Sambandha again uh, uh, through uh, Bhagavad Gita, which is also Itihasa. Uh, we get uh, an exposure to Shruti, which is the root of everything because it's eternal in the form of Isopanishad. Uh, and in that work, we see that, um, though Shankaracharya gives an impersonal <laughs> commentary on it, uh, our Acharyas give a personal commentary on it. So therefore, Upanishads are not necessarily just talking about impersonal or Brahman. They also speak of a Supreme Lord with form. And that is what is concluded in the uh, Isopanishad. So, and it is Shruti. So, it's got some, um, let's say, a strength of uh, authority behind it. Uh, so, we got those the the, the Isopanishad there, and uh, we have the Bhagavad Gita to give us, uh, which is part of the Itihasa, to give us the um, Sambandha again. And of course, there's also the Abhijaya, Bhakti Yoga, and the Prayojana, but. A lot of it is that Sambandha Gyan, which is very important for us also. And we got the Nectar Devotion to give us the Abhidya and the Prayojana, along with the Nectar of Instruction. So in this way, we got all these works giving us the essentials for our advancement in Krishna consciousness. Now, as I said, we do put an emphasis on scripture and knowledge. Uh, without the guidance of scripture, we're bound to go astray. So therefore, we do have to base our actions and sadhana upon scripture. And scripture is not anything. Uh, there's a particular definition of scripture. Huh? So scripture means the Vedas, Shruti. It means the Itihasas, like Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita. It means the Puranas, like Srimad Bhagavatam. And of course, we have other works, Smritis, like Manusmriti. And then we have Pancharatrik Shastras. These are acceptable proofs for us. And we should stay within that, uh, within those works. We should study those works rather than other works. So this will establish a good background in order that we can practice pure bhakti and sudanam or pure chanting. And it's only with that pure chanting that we get to the level of prema. So in that way, the scriptures are actually very necessary for us. Uh, okay, any question there? Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful info. Many times we do neglect uh, this information that why do we have to study all these scriptures? So thank you so much uh, for giving us all this info. Um, the forum is open now for the question and answer. If anyone has any questions, 
um, Maharaj, we are doing this course of Bhakti Shastri. We have completed Bhagavad Gita, Nectar of Instruction and Ishopanishad until now. And uh, we will be starting Nectar of Devotion soon. Uh -huh. So if anybody has any question, please feel free to ask. Okay, by the time everyone thinks about the question, maybe I'll start. <laughs> uh, Maharaj, I wanted to ask uh, that in Bhakti Shastri, we have these four books, but when we go to Bhakti Vaibhava, um, uh, we study Bhagavatam, then why that Bhagavatam has been divided into two different uh, parts, that first six canto will be Bhakti Vaibhava and then next six canto will be um, different study. Why that has been divided? Uh, well, I think because if they put all cantos, all 12 cantos, it would take you 12 years or something. <laughs> they don't want to discourage everybody, so they put it into two parts. <laughs> so, of course, it's better if they have it in one course, but uh, for most people, it'll probably be too long unless they're full-time studying for a few years, you know? So that's why they divided it up into sections. I don't know, they haven't done Chaitanya Chaitanya's part of that. It's a second, separate, yes, uh, after, after that, that, after that, yeah. yeah so <laughs> I think that's the only reason why. Uh, even like the uh, Bhakti Shastri, that's just divided by, that's decided by a group of devotees did that. Uh, uh, and I don't know why they chose those, but obviously Bhagavad Gita is an easy choice because it's an essential book that everybody reads. Uh, but then they chose these other works. Um, actually, I would, I would choose some other works also, but <laughs> like Haridam Chantamani and Madhuri Kadambani as part of your Bhakti Shastri because they're quite eloquent and, and explaining things very nicely and how to do sadhana, et cetera. So I would include those also as interesting works to study. But anyway, uh, they chose th those particular works for the Bhakti Shastri and they then divided up the other courses into different parts. So maybe it's a little arbitrary in one sense, but I think it's also practical because they want to cover most of Prabhupada's major works, but then we have to do that in stages because uh, we can't expect people to dedicate so much time to study. So, if, of course, if you have a university and you're full time doing six hours a day, fine, you could, um, you know, do that. But uh, reality is that most people aren't doing that. <laughs> They're doing the study as a part time thing. So therefore, it takes quite a while. I think like in Melbourne, it took them like two years to get through the Bhakti Shastri or something. I don't know, it's been quite long to get through Bhakti Shastri Same. here also, yeah. So even Bhakti Shastri is taking quite a while. So if you go through the whole Bhagavatam, you take a four, five, six years or seven years or something. So it may be discouraging for people. So then they make a shorter course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, can Hare you Krishna. share some? Oh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Can you please share some tips on how to remember the verses? There are so many verses, important verses of Bhagavad Gita. When we preach or when we want to quote, many, many preachers do that. But what are the tips? How can we remember? How can yeah. we quote? Well, the, the best advice is be a little child. And you repeat it when you're a child, but you're easy to remember them. <laughs> when we get older, it's more difficult. So uh, instead of you memorizing, give it to your children. Let them memorize it. <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, by repetition, main thing is repetition. So if you hear the same verses every day and you repeat them every day, probably when you get up in the morning or something, then you'll memorize them within a week, probably. So basically, that's the idea. Now, of course, verses are good, but I think in the modern world also, they may not be so effective in many cases. Uh, the only people who will appreciate them are the people that already know what the verses mean. And if they don't know Sanskrit and they don't know what you're talking about, then the, you're quoting something, you know, like uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, just like uh, Christians often quote the Bible. You know, it says Isaiah 19, 24, 6, da, da, da. They quote the verse, and it says in this one here, da, 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 da. So they, they got all these verses quoted by heart. So, uh, of course, good for them because they got some proof. But for a person just hearing about it and getting preached to, it's not so impressive because it just looks like they're you know, memorizing things and just quoting all of that. So it may have good effect, may have bad effect, depending on the person you're talking to. <laughs> so that, that's just about you know, quoting verses like that. But traditionally, of course, that's what they do uh, when they are talking and 
uh, debating uh, certain points, they will rely on scripture, so they'll quote something. But that's not the way people talk in the modern world. <laughs> and most people aren't familiar with scripture, so it may not be so effective for that reason. But the main thing behind that scripture, that the quotation is the actual meaning. Uh, so if you can convince them of the meaning, that's even better than just quoting a verse. So along with the quoting the verse, you should also know the meaning of it, <laughs> the implication of the verse. Okay, thank you. Anyone else has any question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Dandakunam. Maharaj, just one question. Like uh, in Prabhupada's uh, purports, uh, he quotes a lot of Upanishads, like uh, left, right, center. Like he has uh, quoted like Manduk. Upanishad, Mundaka Upanishad, Svetasvara Upanishad, and quite a number of Upanishads, which, which means he's very thorough with Upanishad study as well. So he, are there any um, literature available uh, for Vaishnavas to other than the Isha Upanishad, which, uh, mm -hmm. which will give a yeah, yeah. kind so, of uh, yeah. Most of this from from, uh, Vaishnavas come to that perspective. Yeah, as I said, Baladev Vidyabhasana apparently wrote on Ten Upanishads, but we only have one left. <laughs> we don't know where the other ones are, the commentaries. Um, uh, Ranga Ramanuja of the uh, Ramanuja Sampradaya, he's written on those major Upanishads and a few extra ones also. So I think he wrote 12 commentaries or so on that. And Madhvachari has also written commentaries on, I think, 10 Upanishads. So we do have those commentaries of the Vaishnavas. I translated the other Upanishads, the main ones, according to... Uh, Ranga Ramanuja's text. I didn't do all the whole text because some of them are quite long and he's just giving a lot of quotations, but I give the main gist of all those Upanishads like Chandogya and Brihadaranyaka and Mandukya and uh, what's, uh, Mundaka and Prashna and Svetasvatar Upanishad, a Taitri Upanishad, all those ones. So I, I translated those ones with a little bit of the commentary. Uh, of uh, Ranga Ramanuja. Uh, so those are there and they're available. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, the only Upanishad that our Acharya Stick interest in is Gopal Tapati Upanishad. <laughs> <laughs> so we get three or four commentaries on that. Jiva's written a commentary, Vishnu's written a commentary, Prabodhananda Saraswati's written a commentary on this uh, Gopal Tapati Upanishad. Huh? Because that's directly about Krishna. <laughs> and the Krishna Mantra. So they've written a lot of commentaries on that. Unfortunately, that's not one of the comment, uh, Upanishads that Shankarachai wrote a commentary on. <laughs> but it's one that the Gaudiya Sampradaya concentrates on because it is Shruti, and it also mentions Krishna directly. So therefore, it sends it, oh, Krishna's not mentioned in the Shruti. Then we say, no, he is. He is. The Gopal Tafani Upanishad. <laughs> and he's mentioned directly there. Of course, he's also mentioned Chandogya Upanishad. I think Prabhupada quotes in the first uh, commentary, on the commentary in the first verse of the Bhagavatam. It mentions the son of Vasudev huh? in the Chandogya Upanishad. <laughs> so it's okay, Krishna's mentioned there. <laughs> so uh, there are a few mentions of Krishna in the other Shrutis, but um, you know, we have real direct uh, mention in the Gopal Tapani Upanishad. So uh, that's what our Acharyas usually quote that when they want to quote about Krishna, you know, they'll quote from that Upanishad. Uh, now the Acharyas, of course, use the other Upanishads also because uh, that's what the other Acharyas do. So they'll quote also the same Upanishads and give the same proofs or actually disprove something of uh, Shankar Acharya uh, and give it a different meaning. Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah. sure. Uh, Maharaj, <coughs> you are talking about the Bhakti Shastri, mm -hmm. um, the four different uh, books that we have um, prescribed to read. Now, I came across a, a clipping um, that said that during Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur time, the eligibility to enter into Bhakti Shastri where Chaitanya Charitamrita, Chaitanya Bhagavat, Bhakti Ratnakara, 
ಸೊ ಜೈವ ಧರ್ಮ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಶಿಕ್ಷಾಮೃತ ಗೌರಿಯ ಕಂತಹಾರ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಒನ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ಸಪೋಸ್ ಟು ಬಿ ರೆಡ್ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಈವನ್ ಒನ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಎಂಟರ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಭಕ್ತಿ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಶಾಸ್ತ್ರಿ but most of these other works we see are more we can say are somewhat biographical works mm. like bhakti ratnakar is not so much philosophy it's just the life story of chitanya mahaprabhu nityananda shrinivasacharya gopal bhatta like that it gives their life histories so mm. a lot of it is that i think the other works also you mentioned here it's also uh Chaitanya Bhagavad again is uh, a lot of uh, yeah. biographical information. Some philosophy, but a lot, lot is biographical. Um, and Chaitanya Shramar is half biographical, half philosophical. Uh, um, but it looks like a lot of this is to emphasize the Chaitanya aspect of everything, to give a basis in Lord Chaitanya's version of everything before you get into the actual study of the texts. Thank you, Maharaj. Anand Prabhuji, you had a question. Anand Prabhuji. Uh, yes, Mataji. Uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Mm. My humble obeisances. Just uh, one question, Maharaj. Like, uh, we are all doing Bhakti Shastri. And we also do the Bhakti Vruksha courses. And when we are doing Bhakti Vruksha, the, there are new devotee comes, like new people. i cannot say devotee but the new people and everyone they don't uh, follow our vaishnava philosophy but what we are learning uh, like uh, in bhakti shastri is all vaishnava philosophy or our iskon philosophy and when we are talking about them they have uh, sometime like you know they argument with uh, our philosophy like uh, vaishnava siddhanta okay so, uh, my question is because sometime their question we cannot clarify giving our references from our uh, like you know shastra whatever shrimad bhagavatam bhagavad gita in that case feels like uh, whatever our uh, study material is not enough to give them answer so because they, right now it's like a uh, everyone watch on a youtube they come with different ideas and they ask question sometimes it's very very like you know uh that uh, debate or argument go into the very high level so in that situation how can we deal maharaj well one thing of course is first we should establish what is the basis of our argument is it our opinions or is it scripture so if they don't want to accept scripture then of course it's kind of useless <laughs> now if they accept scripture then we say okay what scripture we're going to speak on at that point probably most of them won't be too well equipped with any particular scripture but only they'll have heard something from somebody else that the souls of book says something maybe most of the people are going to be in that category huh? so maybe on that point if they can't really say then what's up first if you want to talk then you 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 please choose a scripture and we can see if it's a valid scripture <laughs> then you come back and speak <laughs> but then we should also give them the list of the valid scriptures you have the vedas the upanishads you got the puranas you got the mahabharat whatever like that these are the ones you choose from huh? but then we can also say to make it easier that's so much work if you want to read the mahabharat it's going to take you a few years <laughs> if you read all the puranas it's going to take you many years also if you want to read the vedas it's going to take you years if you want to make it easier you should read bhagavad gita so give them a bhagavad gita so read this then you come back and ask questions <laughs> Now of course it depends on the person of course um the arguers can be of different sorts we'll have the pure atheists and of course if they're atheists generally we don't even bother arguing uh, because we don't speak we don't preach to the faithless <laughs> we just give them prasadam huh? uh so therefore uh, better just to feed them prasadam and let them hear the kirtan and <laughs> don't discuss philosophy with them huh? now uh the other difficult persons may be the impersonalists uh, particularly those who are following shankaracharya most of them also will not really have a, a grounding in uh they haven't studied shankar's you know commentary in the brahma sutras in detail it's very complex as philosophy so they probably even got that study but they just have some general information about you know the ultimate is supreme impersonal brahman or something like that and we merge into brahman etc uh so but they may be very convinced of that So these are another type of people that actually 
it's better not to preach to them <coughs> if they're so convinced, you know. Better that we just uh, let them hear Kirtan again. Huh? Uh, then the other people are people are kind of innocent, <clears throat> but they may have some false ideas. So we can preach to them, and if they're flexible, then we can correct them. But we try to base it all on scripture. So that's why Bhakti Shastri is uh, useful. <coughs> Thank you, Maharaji. You have a particular question to ask that you can answer? As you said, like uh, they come, they listen on the YouTube and they come with the, because we have a design Bhakti Vriksha course. And when uh -huh. we are talking about uh, any particular topic, they actually yeah. do study. And when they come next week, they have different, different questions about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So, as you said, like, uh, we invite them at the home, then we prasha them, and some, sometimes they uh, agree with our philosophy, but some people, they just leave, like, they don't come back again, mm -hmm. because they have their different, but I found that Sri Sampradaya people, they attach to our Sampradaya, mostly, than other, like, Buddhist, and one time, like, uh, one Muslim family used to come to our Bhakti Vriksha, because yeah. they have the impersonalism and they means maybe I wasn't uh, prepared that time to convince them. So maybe oh, okay. I have to do more study. Yeah, yeah of <laughs> course, uh, with such people, if they have some attraction, you don't have to emphasize the philosophical points. Okay, uh, impersonal one, useless, Allah is useless, only Krishna with a flute is, you should worship. We don't have to emphasize things like that. We take the positive things. Okay, you like to glorify God. Very good. And they'll agree with that. Huh? You should be regulated. You should do it every day. They'll agree with that because they're supposed to do six times a day. They should offer prayers. So like that, you should glorify God constantly all day long. Let them, let them do that. Huh? So you encourage them with things which they are familiar with. Yeah? And we also accept. Huh? And just leave it at that and all the philosophical things leave for later. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. I just had a question. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask, um, in mundane studies, let's say in high school or university and so forth, we sometimes study because we like the topic and sometimes we don't. But either way, there are situations where, let's say you have an exam the next day, then suddenly it's a high pressure, high stress type situation. And even if you like the topic, you dislike it because of all the pressure and the stress of the exams and so forth. So mm -hmm. when someone studies Bhakti Shastri, how can we avoid seeing our study of Bhagavad Gita and so forth as a mundane exercise? Because we understand that it's transcendental. We understand that there's great rasa and taste in it. But at the same time, when Bhakti Shastri exam is tomorrow, suddenly everyone sees it as a mundane thing. There's, there's stress, yeah. there's pressure, there's anxiety. So how can we um, see it in the right way? Yeah, well, that's the problem with courses that, you know, it may create stress like that. So um, uh, the real way of studying, I say it's not just learning things and memorizing things. It should be digested properly, and uh, it goes along with our sadhana. So uh, the proper learning process when you're studying chapter two or three or four or whatever is to figure out how it's applicable to your sadhana, how you can relate it to your sadhana. Then it'll be a little more valuable for you, and it won't be such pressure to learn anything because you can apply it in your life, so to speak, you know? Uh, that type of learning. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, because we do have courses and we're uh, kind of stuck in the model of uh, what university type courses, and we do have exams and all of this, um, then that has, of course, this negative aspect. Um, but if we try to apply the things uh, in our life and see how significant they are, uh, you know, for instance, if we understand the nature of Krishna from Bhagavad Gita and have verses that relate to that 
and then that can help us when we are uh, thinking of Krishna, meditating on Krishna, chanting Hare Krishna. So, you know, in that way it becomes more relishable. It's not just a, a learning exercise. It becomes something that you can use it to help you experience Krishna. So if we do that, then it becomes less of a uh, like an, a material learning thing and more of a, a valuable tool for your spiritual advancement and devotional service. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Uh, I have one question. So one of my friend uh, follows Mayavadi, like Brahm Kumari, and she is following... Well, that's not even Mayavadi, that's something else. It's, uh, no, I don't I don't know. Know. <laughs> it's a new thing. <laughs> yeah, Maharaj, so she is following very sincerely, she is very innocent. And they teach them, like, you know, all philosophy except Lord. They don't tell that there is Bhagwan. They accept, like, uh, we are soul, we are not body. But, uh, and she is following so sin sincerely, and she always appreciates. But I, fo I follow what Prabhupada and our Guru says. So I don't accept it, but I don't want to argue with her. But... Uh, uh, she uh, doesn't accept my view and I don't accept her view. But how to do, uh, I don't want to, you know, I want to keep a sweet relationship with her. And But whenever we talk, we talk about spirituality and all. So I'm facing a little difficulty, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. keeping a relationship with her. Yeah. I, yeah. Hmm. So, of course, we don't preach to the faithless people. And if they don't have faith, even if you preach to them, they're not going to accept what you say because they have their own beliefs. So she has her faith in, uh, who is it? The Dada? Who is it? Dada G or something? Baba. Some, some uh, uh, Baba. guy with a white beard or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dada G or something? <laughs> anyway, they have their own authority, uh, whatever, and they're stuck on that. If they're too stuck on it, of course, then... No, 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 it's different. Yeah. He's oh, from, uh, he, he was, uh, what, from um, Bombay, side. Bombay side, oh. Mumbai. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, you, you know, don't, don't really speak about that. Just let them hear kirtan, give them prashadam, things like that. Be friendly with them. <laughs> and don't discuss the philosophy. <laughs> and eventually by, you know, hearing the kirtan more and more, maybe they're going to get a little convinced that way. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Andres. Okay. So, Anyone has any question? I'm done. Okay. Thank you very much, Maharaj. I thank you from all our Bhakti Shastri group. Thank you so much for Hare coming Krishna. and giving your association and your valuable time. Thank you. Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Do we have comment, please, on Chaitanya? Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.